Thank you for tuning in to Ungentrified with Kent Johnson. Ungentrified takes an unfiltered view on pop culture, music, television and film, politics, current events, and topics central to the worldwide Black community. Ungentrified is a safe audio space for celebrating Black culture in its purest form. Thank you for joining another episode of Ungentrified. This is your boy, Kent Johnson, and we're going to do things a little bit differently today because I want to spend as much time as we can learning about this incredible story. So before I introduce who I have, I'm going to ask her to tell us what I ask everybody on the show, which is what's on their radar at the moment. So it could be whatever YouTube hole you've fallen into, whatever Netflix binge you're on, what book you're reading. What's your jam of the moment? What's on your radar right now? Oh, okay. So, um, at first I had one, and then as you kind of went through different things, I've got three now. <laughs> so, one is Rosé or Frosé. If you don't know, that's Frozen Rosé, and it's the best. Um, second, what book am I reading? My book. <laughs> and I'm, like, currently obsessed with it right now because it just released two weeks ago. Congrats. Um, and then thirdly, um, like we were talking about before, just some movies that are out now that represent diversity. I am super excited about that. And it's just confirmation for me that the book was something that was needed. Um, like you've got Coco, you've got Black Panther, I always want to call it Wakanda. Um, <laughs> then you've got Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and you know, when I see trailers for Crazy Rich Asians, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. And, you know, even my friends that are Asian that have watched it and how excited they are. Um, it just makes me think like when I was younger, if I would have had that kind of representation, if that would have made me feel a lot differently about how I looked growing up in the environment that I did. So mm -hmm. super excited that um, just that diversity and that kids get to see themselves represented in different genres. Agreed. Uh, what's on my radar at the moment? So what's on my radar at the moment is actually something that's old, but I'm playing catch up. So uh, when How to Get Away with Murder first came out, I was adamant about it and was watching it and fell off like two seasons ago. And I in a bit Two of boredom this week. Ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> in a bit of boredom this weekend, I saw that Four Seasons was on Netflix. So I started catching up and I think I watched like 16 episodes this weekend. Oh, it was bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I that binge watching. Yeah. They said that's why people have um, problems going to sleep now. Yeah. Because they get so caught up in the binge watch. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's bad. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't realize how deep I had fallen into oh, the wow. hole, um, but I'm almost caught up. So that's what I've been on yeah. right now is how to get away with murder. And you can't just skip a season with that show because so much happens in just one episode right. that you would be totally lost. Yeah. So. yeah. And I hate, well, I mean, I, I love how it's set up, how it, you're working kind of from both ends. You're burning both ends of the stick like you're in the present, but you're slowly catching up to whatever yes. it is that's happened. Uh, and I think that's what kept me watching. Because <laughs> I was like, all right, yeah. I'm almost there. I got one more episode and I find out who died. Or, <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and I think that's what drew me in, too, to that show, was yeah. how they did the storyline. It was just so different yeah. than how most shows are. Yeah, so that that's what's been on my radar right now. Uh, oh. Music-wise, nothing new right now. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of just old stuff, just letting my my iTunes shuffle and do its thing. So ah. I, I don't have anything that's like a jam at the moment yeah. right now. Oh, uh, I've been doing a lot of shuffling, but my two favorite songs is that little Duval song. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just, it just makes me happy. And yeah. then when he says it, it sounds like your uncle. You're like, oh, it sounds like something my uncle would say. <laughs> um, and then that Summertime Magic by Childish Gambino. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's a jam. I love that song. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are probably wondering who I've been talking to for the last couple of minutes, and I'm going to go ahead and let her 
introduce ourselves. So go ahead and tell the people who you are. Hi, or like I always uh, typically introduce myself. Hey, y'all. <laughs> uh, this is Cindy. Some people know me as Cindy Michelle or your favorite Asian Southern Belle. A couple of weeks ago, well, I've known Cindy for quite some time, and we all, we've always seen each other in passing uh, at events throughout the city. Social scene, yes. Hotlanta. <laughs> the who's who of, of Atlanta, right? Um, so a couple of weeks ago... She posted on her timeline that she was dropping a book, and she left a YouTube link to kind of give people an idea what the book was going to be about. So me being nosy, clicked on the link and got hit with a shocker of a story (laughs) that I had no idea of. Um, Why don't you go ahead and tell the people a little bit about your background? Okay. Um, Yeah, so it's interesting how everything has kind of timed out, like... um, First, well, I started last year writing the book about my story, and then um, earlier this year, I did a YouTube video with Casey um, C. Bud, and um, it was just kind of like a snippet of the book, mm-hmm. and it just really talked about how I grew up uh, being adopted in Korea by an African-American family, but I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. And just so how that experience was and how I got picked on and bullied and how I had to take up for myself. But that really led to me taking up for other people like my brother, my friends, or just anybody that I felt was being picked on by people, which kind of leads into the book, you know, just um, my, what I would call my form of activism of, you know, really letting people know that um, just because somebody looks a certain kind of way doesn't mean that you have to, that you should bind them to those stereotypes. Um, Like just because I look Asian doesn't mean that that is per se my culture or how I've been influenced. And it's interesting just how throughout life people make those assumptions and, you know, having different friends like that are black, that are Asian um, and hearing the assumptions that are made about them very often just because of the way they look, um, I just think it's time to like break out of that. And that that's why uh, what really influenced me to write the book and then to really share my story, Too Much Soul. Yes, yes. So maybe a week or so after you dropped a YouTube video, the book came out. And as you mentioned, it's Too Much Soul. I'm always interested in what brings people to whatever point they are in their life. And I just thought you had an incredible story, and I wanted to tell as many other people as I could about it. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> no problem. I figured, hey, why not bring Cindy on the show? So, let's let's do some groundwork here. So okay. let's let's start at the beginning. Okay. And talk about uh, your mom and dad. So okay. they were stationed in Korea, right? Yes, and yes. they were in the army, and so mm, I was probably maybe a month or just a few weeks old when they adopted me. And um, shortly after we moved back to the States and we moved to Chicago. And initially my parents adopted me because my mom would have so many miscarriages. So she didn't think that she could have any kids. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, they had my brother, Adrian. Um, And then we moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My parents got a divorce so myself, my mom, and my brother moved back to Jackson, Mississippi when I was seven. Wow. So, and you spent the majority of like your adolescent life in Mississippi. Yes. Yes. Because you've only been here in Atlanta for what, eight years eight now? Eight years. And then I lived in Birmingham, Alabama for four years. So starting off in Korea, moving back to the States, mm-hmm. having a younger brother, mm-hmm. Then moving, because you moved to Chicago, was it? You said Illinois? Chicago, and then Winston-Salem, and then, and then the, the dirty South. <laughs> the dirtiest yeah. of South, because you were in in Jackson. Jacktown. We call Jack- it Jacktown. Oh, okay. And then we tell people, check our crime stats. Don't mess with us. <laughs> so, Kids get nervous. You get nervous. You can't. Don't be nervous. Oh, no. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Look, I'm from Baltimore. I'm good. Oh, so, okay. All <laughs> check right. Check our crime stats. Yeah, we're, I've heard, yeah. we're, we're neck and neck. All right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> so that's where really too much soul starts to begin for you. Because yes. that's where you start to realize who 
you are as an individual, yes. uh, even though you have plenty of other people trying to well, tell you who you are. It was kind of forced on me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very forced on me. Yeah. Um, so I talk about in the book how when I lived in Winston-Salem, there were um, a lot of kids in the neighborhood. If you t- asked me like what their color was, I honestly could not remember. Like maybe they were white. I don't know. I just remember like playing in one of the neighbor's kids' RVs that they had. That was fun. And like we just play. We were just mm-hmm. kids. And nobody ever pointed out my differences, like my physical differences or the fact that I look different from my family. Um, but then when I moved to Jackson, <laughs> they loved to point that out. So I had to learn very quickly that I'm different, but it wasn't necessarily in a positive way um, because it led to me being picked on a lot um, just because I look different than the majority, which was white and black. And and you talk about this in the book uh, that you had, you went to periods where you had white friends and you had black friends. So what kinds of questions were you getting from either side about like your your family because I'm sure they meet you and they meet they meet you first and they have their impression of you and then maybe your little brother may walk up and, mm-hmm. and when you introduce him they're like huh yeah and it kind of opens up this door so how are you having that initial conversation with people once they start to figure out like the extra sides of you mm-hmm. with- um Well, growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, it's not that big. Mm -hmm. So everybody you meet is really like you pick up the phone, you call somebody and you're like, hey, I met so-and-so. What's up with that person? And you learn their life story in less than 30 seconds. Um, So I would say that I didn't really get those type of questions a lot um, because people just knew that my, that I was Asian and that my family was black. And so it was just kind of the norm. Um, but until up until the point where, you know, at first I, I knew I was adopted. And then when I was going into junior high was when, you know, according to my mom, she says, she read the book and she said, well, you didn't talk about what happened that day that I told you you know, that you were my, my child and you weren't adopted. So in other words, like my mom did not tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, and she told, she said that I was having a bad day. I was very sad. I was very depressed because I was getting picked on a lot. And so she made up the story that she was my birth mother. So I was part Asian, part black, but it was somewhat believable because people would always say that we looked alike. And I don't know if it's just a thing where you feed them long enough, they start to look (laughs) like you. Um, Well, it's always that if you're around somebody long enough, you start to take on their their appearances. So so she told me uh, this story. And from her perspective, she was happy because she felt like I had a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And so I I get it and I get why she did it. And it did kind of give me that at the time. But then too, it's like, I feel like when you are, when you know what your truth is, then that's what gives you your life experience of living through that truth. And no matter what the consequences are, Mm -hmm. like I would have been able to deal with that period because I like, regardless of what she told me or didn't tell me, I still had to deal with people picking on me just because I look different. So that may have kind of helped a little um and you know it did give me somewhat that sense of belonging but that still didn't change what I look like on the outside right and how people responded to me yeah so okay after your mother told you that did you start to change how you responded when people approached you did after she told you that she was your birth mother or gave mm-hmm. put that idea in you if someone that you met maybe a week or two after that asked mm-hmm. you, like, you know, what's your deal? What what are you, Cindy? It would you probably, say? I, I feel like it probably did because I was already bold, but it probably gave me more of a boldness. Like, I'm sure, and I, I probably recall, like, there were times where I'd, and I still say it now, even knowing that, you know, she is my adopted mom. But I would just tell, I'd be like, my mama black. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't come at me like that. Like, yeah. It probably did give me more confidence 
with in boldness mm -hmm. with how I responded to people at the time, I would say it probably did change the way I reacted and responded to people. Once you found out the truth, because you, you talked about how you learned that later that that was not the truth. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that you reflected on? You're like, man, had had I known differently, I would have done this differently as a kid or as a teenager, or I would have thought about looking into this more. Was there any kind of reflective moment where you're like, that could have completely changed course for me? No, because I mean, you know, like I, I never live with regret or mm -hmm. like looking back or what if, or if I could have changed this. Um, but the thing that I do think about is um, how, you know, if that would have changed the course of my life and how I responded to people um, just living through my truth versus, um, you know, having this false sense of belonging um, that wasn't true because I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, you're your mom is a very interesting individual. And I, I felt like I learned a lot about her in mm -hmm. reading your book. But one of the things that stood out to me is that your mom was a Republican. Or yes. I don't know, is she still a Republican? Um, I mean, I know that she will vote on both sides now. Mm -hmm. Before, she would not. Like, growing up, she would not. Right. Um, So I do think, uh, like, when... Like when we talk about Republican, it's not this new Republic. It's not like a Trump Republican. Right. Like she's a Republican to the truest sense of like economy, very conservative. Um, and then when it comes to Republican values, like she is all on board when it comes to that. Um, but the new type of Republican, no. like no, <laughs> she doesn't know. She doesn't get down with that at all. Yeah, I, I thought it was incredibly interesting because I was like, well, if we laid out all of the things we learned about your mom from the book, that you know she was in the military and adopted a young Korean girl, came back to the states, moved that family to the you know the deepest of south. And that she had a moment in the book where she told you not to trust white people. <laughs> if yeah. you heard all of those things, and then at the end you heard a oh, and she's a Republican, mm -hmm. and she was like the head of the Republican, she was the president, yeah, of the Republicans Women's Committee, yeah, yeah. It, all of those things that you heard before, <laughs> you're like wait what, yeah, are the <laughs> the polar opposite in what I expected yeah. um, when when I read that. So I was like wait a minute, I, I read it again. I was yeah. like. Oh, yeah, it definitely says Republican. Yeah. Well, and that just goes to show, too, like, she would tell me those things about not trusting white people. It was just based off of her experience. Mm -hmm. And so those things get passed down through generations and generations. Like, you know, we'll look at how white people pass down certain things, but other families do it, too. I've been in an Uber with somebody that was um, Ethiopian. And we were talking, I was like, oh, Ethiopian babies are so pretty to me. And she was saying how like Chinese people live there too. And they have babies together. I was like, what? <laughs> I need to see these babies. And so I was, I said, based off of what I know about Ethiopians and their culture and tribes, like that you guys are very strict about mixing, like even with tribes. Mm -hmm. And she was, she said, yeah, but I mean, for the most part, it's not that big of a deal the only people that my parents have told me not to um, have a baby with are black people, which I was like, huh? oh, wait, what? <laughs> and so it's just their perception of like either what they see on TV or an experience that mm -hmm. they've had. So that kind of blew my mind when she said that, because, you know, I'm thinking, well, don't you consider yourself black? But I know I hear a lot of di different dialogue when it comes to like Africans and black Americans too, and the differences there. Yeah. So it's interesting just to hear how different groups or races of people, like they pass on those different perceptions and stereotypes to their kids just based off of like what they've been through. Mm -hmm. And you, you brought up a good point. So you have a very unique position in life. So do you think that serves a favor to you? Because a lot of times before people find out about Cindy's, you know, history. They know you as Cindy 
Korean girl. Mm-hmm. So, or in Jackson, Chinese or, girl. Or Chinese girl, mm-hmm. right, depending upon... <laughs> their exposure. The, right, yeah, depending mm-hmm. upon levels of exposure. So before they get to learn more about you, you have that initial reaction from people. Mm-hmm. Do you have conversations with people before they know that you come from a black family that are like side eye worthy or like if they only knew what I'm about to tell them right. about my family all the time. So like even I reference it in my book like I am what you would call a fly on the wall. Mm-hmm. Like the things I've gotten to hear like people are very comfortable around me, like everybody. And I've heard different perspectives from white people, Asian people, black people that, I mean, I know like they wouldn't necessarily want to be that upfront and honest with other groups of people or Mm -hmm. put that out um, publicly, whatever, you know, their statements. Um, So like I've had situations where people like will say certain things about like I've heard Indian people say certain things about black people. And some people are so ignorant where I'm like, there's nothing I can say that's going to change who you are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even going to try because (laughs) you're just toxic. Um, And then there are some people, I'll let them go on their little rant and I'll be like, oh, really? Well, you know, I was adopted by a black family. So my family's (laughs) black. And they're like, "Uh, uh, uh, really? (laughs) Um, Or even with like black people, like I, I forget, like I'm just, I am who I am. So I just start talking, I talk about different things and probably the things that relate to me the most are more like black culture when it comes to entertainment, music, um, television and things of that nature. So when I start talking about things like that, (laughs) I'm super comfortable about about it. Um, They'll kind of, I always notice they have this look on their face like, whoa, what is going on right now? And sometimes I'll tell them, and then some, but I, and like when I was younger, I would preface and, and kind of let them know because I'm like, okay, I know they're going to be looking at me like, what does this girl know about our music or whatever? Um, but now I, I don't like maybe I'll, as the conversation goes, or I notice they kind of get that look on their face where they're like, I really don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> um, then I'll tell them and they always have that aha moment. Like you see where the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, yeah. okay, now I get it. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a, it's a privilege that, that you have to be able mm-hmm. to navigate certain spaces and have people not assume your your knowledge base on a lot or right. just your, your personal experience on right. a lot. Um, there's always talk now, especially – uh, in the era of Trump, about people utilizing and spending their privilege appropriately. Mm-hmm. So I know you're you're very focused on helping people see the humanity in yes. things, and that's where you kind of allocate, you know, your privilege and your your knowledge base and your experience to. So you you brought up how you are very comfortable in black spaces and Mm -hmm. and your mom had you in very traditionally black institutions like you were you were a jack and jill kid i was (laughs) i was and i wasn't uncomfortable because it was a black institute i was uncomfortable because i was a tomboy so i'm like why do i have to put this big frou-frou dress on with ruffles and gloves and my hair is curly and it's super high that just wasn't me as an individual because I, I like and I'm still kind of a tomboy to heart now. Um, like I'm a feminine tomboy. But as far as just being a part of that organization, I didn't have a problem or issue with that because they were black. And actually, you know, I talk about in the book how now I appreciate mm-hmm. that and other things that my mom would have me be a part of because of the exposure. Otherwise, Certain groups of people, had I not been exposed to that, I wouldn't be comfortable in those environments. And now you could put me anywhere. And (laughs) I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, Where's the food? (laughs) (laughs) And by your own choice, you are an HBCU grad. Is that right? I am. Well, and actually my mom went to, uh, so I went to Jackson State University. Mm -hmm. My mom went to school there and my grandma went to school there and my grandma worked there. So, oh, so your legacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely have a legacy there. When I went there, everybody knew who my grandma was because she had just retired a couple of years before that. Um, so 
they knew who she was and um, she definitely had a huge presence on campus and so but I loved my experience um I mean there it wasn't all just great but for the most part I loved my experience there Mm -hmm. at Jackson State so was undergrad a different space for you because now even though you're still in the south you have people coming from all over the country and in some cases the world Mm -hmm. to this university now so did you feel like that was a different experience in the sense that you weren't necessarily explaining who you were like you did in high school or, or earlier than that, because now you're you're coming from spaces where where people are familiar with uh, Korean people and can I, I easily identify, oh, no, you're Korean. I know because I'm from New York and I'm familiar yeah. with that or um, or I'm from California and yeah. I'm familiar with that. It, did the story change or did people's approaches to you change when you got to Jackson State? I would probably say it got a little better. Mm -hmm. Like there was still some of that ignorance and people that would just make fun of me because I look different. Um, But then there were like the Michigan crew, like you knew not to mess with them or just different groups of people that were really open. And it just made me respect them. And I'm still friends with them to this day. It's like we're family, like people that would advocate for me on my behalf because they wanted to see me win in certain situations you know that I would be going for so that really did so for me it helped make that experience more of like a family type of experience um, because you know even through some of the ignorance there were people that really advocated for me, stood up for me, and like pushed for me to excel at the highest level that I could. And there were certain things you couldn't do at Jackson State that you may have done in middle school or high school because you you used to be a fighter. Like when people used to challenge you, you used to throw them bows. That's right. That's right. Like I say, I had a mean windmill. (laughs) Um, You know how um, somebody could come up to somebody and be like, they hit that person and then hit the other person and be like, they just hit you. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, what? Now I got to fight. <laughs> and the person didn't even touch me. Um, but, um, yes, I talk about in the book how people would still come for me. But I knew that if I fought, there were consequences behind that. And I was enjoying my freedom and, like, you know, figuring myself out as a person and living my life, like not being so sheltered from my family. So there was no way I was going back home because I, I fought somebody, Mm -hmm. but I I came very close, very close. (laughs) So, um, but luckily it never happened. So yeah, Yeah, we, we couldn't have you at Jackson state Sully and your grandma's good name. You couldn't do that. Community college. Here I come. (laughs) (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with community colleges. But I'm glad I was able to serve out my four years at Jackson State. And I even got my graduate degree there also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. So. Yeah, so let's get into some tough questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you look like you were waiting on that. Right. <laughs> I had to hit you with the you know soft blows. Yeah. Let's, let's get to oh, it. Oh, those are soft. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in the last couple of years, the term transracial has become a thing, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, I think we're all familiar with Rachel Dolezal. I don't, I don't even know what her new name is. Yeah, um, I don't even know how to pronounce her last name. <laughs> but before she kind of brought that term back to life, the, the true meaning of transracial is when there's an adoption where the race of the parents is different from the race of the adopted child. Mm-hmm. It's also referred to as uh, transnational okay. in some cases. So that's the original definition of it. And I talk about it. transracial adoption in my yeah. book too. Yeah. So when when you saw the Rachel story starting to to come about, how did you feel about that? Did it bring up kind of memories for you? Or did you feel like, you know, that's completely opposite of of what my experience was? What yeah. was... What was your thought about Rachel and her declaration of transracial? I thought it was interesting and it made me want, like, I feel like everybody was so critical of her, but it made me want to understand why. 
you know, not saying that it was right or that it was wrong, but like, why? I think the only issue that I would have with that per se is that you should still be okay with who you are as an individual. Even though like when my mom said I was like half black, half Korean, and it made me have that sense of belonging, like, no, I still need to know like, and, and own and be authentic to who I truly am. Mm -hmm. And so that was the only part that I, I wish, you know, would have been different. Even when I did the YouTube video and people would be like, oh, she thinks she's black and da -da. no, I'm very clear with like, I know my ethnicity externally, I'm Asian and I am treated as such, mm -hmm. like whether that be in a negative or a positive way, I'm treated as such. But because of my family dynamics and my experience, I am more heavily influenced by African-American or black culture. So my only thing is God created you as a white woman like that. You shouldn't be ashamed of. And it's OK that you're a white woman that has an affinity or you relate more to African-American culture. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But then when you deny a part of who you are, then to me, that's when maybe you need to go see somebody and talk <laughs> to them about that and figure it out. But like I said, the psychology of what goes on through her head, I don't know. So mm -hmm. that would be something I would want to know more of. But I don't think that just because you relate to or you're more influenced by certain things that you, you should deny who you are as a person. Yeah, it's a it's a very different thing than what transracial initially set out to be mm -hmm. defined as. And what we've seen lately yeah, is people she went all out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's people Do really it for the culture, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> She's like NAACP yeah, she... president. Yeah. yeah. But it was it was more of a individual declaration versus it being a term for how you were adopted. And that mm -hmm. and I think if people ever attempted to make a correlation between you two, there isn't one really there because well, people tried. Yeah, I, and I'm sure it looks like yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't think so, but you know. Yeah. Luckily, I know who I am as a person now. Where uh, probably just a couple of years ago, if I would have read a lot of those comments, I would have been like, "Ooh, uh, uh, no, I'm about to say some to this person." <laughs> but uh, I just laughed. I was like, "Okay, you know who I am, not you know," and I, it's just a snippet of who I am as a person. It's interesting. And I do think too, with just the way society is now and the way things are going with things being so integrated, mm -hmm. it's going to be harder to really identify culture to a certain race yeah. after a couple of years. I think it's going to be more of a challenge, yeah. honestly. And I think that's why people are clinging on to it more. I think yeah. as we see things as, okay, no, this is what I am, but this is what I identify as. And, yeah. and you know, those, the nuances between race, identity, and culture, because they're very, yeah. a lot of times they can be the same, but sometimes they can be it markedly blurred. different things. Yeah. It can get blurred, yeah. 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 So for you, what do you identify or define as culture? What would be your definition? What's Cindy's definition of culture? Um. So I do the web definition in my book which is like one of those long blah 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 definitions but to me culture is like really like what influences you you know what what has heavily influenced you to become the person that you are um whether through your connections through music entertainment um how you what kind of simulates your mind as far as you know what educates you and things of that nature. So that's how I would more so define culture for myself. Um, because even even when I did the video, like I'm Asian, but my culture is black, like, I, like I'm really not that one dimensional either. I'm influenced by a lot. Like I talk about in my book, you know, like I went through different periods where different things influenced me when it came to music or food or friends. And, and I know that it's hard... Like, even saying black culture, like, what is that? You know, like, some people would try to correct me and be like, African-American culture. But then there's some Africans that don't want mm -hmm. black people to say African-American culture because they feel that it's separate. So it that's just hard to 
define that when it comes to race specifically. So that's why I would just say whatever heavily influences you when it comes to different genres. And on that note, we're going to take a brief break, but we'll be right back to wrap up this episode of Ungentrified after a word from one of our sponsors. One Music Fest continues to tap into the urban progressive culture that has made Atlanta a hub in the music and entertainment industry. I'm excited to announce that I, your boy Kent Johnson, is an official brand ambassador for what is now the largest two-day festival in the entire Southeast, the One Music Fest. If you've ever been before, this year is bigger and better than ever, with double the artists such as Nas, 2 Chains, Miguel, Her, Jeezy, T.I., Brandy, Khalees, George Clinton, and the Parliament Funkadelic, the list just goes on. You need to be at the new location for One Music Fest Central Park the weekend of September 8th. You can copy your tickets at onemusicfest.com. You talk about it in your book when you moved to Atlanta and you really started to get exposed to Korean culture. Mm-hmm. And and when you started to have friends that were Asian or Korean and and you would refer to Korean culture as their culture, mm-hmm. and they would try to correct you, and you're like, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> I said what I said. Yeah. <laughs> because it, you really didn't have an opportunity to relate to that. There was no Korean population, well, at least not in the majority, in, in Jackson. Yeah, I didn't know of any Koreans that lived there. If they did, I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. And I had two Asian friends that were both Chinese, hence why people would call me Chinese. Um, and so there weren't a lot of Asian people there and no Korean people that were there when I was there to my knowledge. So no, like I had very limited exposure. Even when I moved to Birmingham, I didn't really know a lot of Asian people. Like I, I met some Blasian people, um, but I really didn't meet a lot there either. But Atlanta, <laughs> you just go on Beaver Highway or Pleasant Hill and they're like, hello, here we are. And then my mom... Growing up, she knew one Korean dish. So I was like, oh, yeah, I got to get that um, while I'm here. So I would go to the Korean barbecue spots and try different things. And I was like, whoa. My mind was, well, I was like, I feel like this is a part of who I am for sure. So, I mean, when it comes to the food, I definitely feel a connection. And I don't know, like sometimes even with the their manner, like Asian people's mannerisms are very similar to black people to me. And then I'm like. They call their food barbecue, you know, like, (laughs) hello, like we are one, you know, black people, Korean people, you know. Yeah. And then since I've lived here, I've also gone to like the Korean festival and just that exposure, you know, if I would have had more of that exposure when I was younger, that probably would have piqued my interest more to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. And then like now with crazy rich Asians and Asian people being represented in a positive light that matters and that makes a difference and never wanted to go back to Korea before, but the past couple of years since I've lived here, it really has sparked my interest. And so Sunday I'm actually going to be going to Seoul, Korea. I didn't so, know it was that close. I knew you were going. Yeah. I didn't know it was like, that's why I'm like the a timing of, of everything is just <laughs> so crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we're definitely going to have to follow up when you get back. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I, wow. I didn't know it was that close. Yeah, I really didn't. That was Sunday. A, I wasn't prepared for that. That right. wasn't in the show notes. <laughs> uh, wow. So so what's going through your mind now, knowing that you're kind of completing a circle of sorts? Yeah. So, like, at first, I put a lot of pressure on myself, like, well, what if I don't have a connection or then what, you know, and, like, how am I supposed to feel And then I just kind of had to stop myself and either I have a connection with it or I don't. I have to at least go and be open to seeing what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, the way society boxes you into certain things and because of how I've been influenced, it's like, well, now can I go back and now say, you know, yes, Korean is a part of my culture now. It's like, I don't know. But then too, I feel like, it's okay for me to redefine like what I'm comfortable with, you, not not like change my race or who right. I am as a person. Right. Um, but I mean, redefine my experience and be okay with knowing that this is just another part of my journey, and I'm going through all this for a reason and a purpose. And just even like with my life experience, like I used to hate 
being looking different and then my family looking different and having to deal with all those dynamics growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, like where a lot of people were not that open and there was limited exposure. It helped to mold me into the person that I am today. And I for sure wouldn't be sharing such a unique story to other people um, had I not gone through that. So. And you, you mentioned the YouTube interview that you did. Have you met any other people? I think the girl, was it Casey? Mm -hmm. She had a, a similar experience to you, right? She grew yes. up in a, a black household. She is mixed. She's, okay. So she's mixed with white and black. But, um, and it's, it's crazy because even when I met her, she was talking. I was like, oh, this white girl, she's so cool. And then we were all talking, and all of a sudden she said, yeah, you know, a mix of black. And everybody was like, <laughs> We were like, wait, what? You know, I feel like the way we did her is how a lot of people do me. Uh... And so I was like, you know, I'm not as evolved as I would like to be. But, you know, I thought it was interesting. And, I mean, that really connected us. And we literally talked all night about our experiences and how people try to box us in um, just based off of how we look or mm -hmm. like for her, you know, like well, you're not really black cause you don't look black, you know? Yeah, She, she could definitely pass. Yeah. hundred percent. Until you said it, I didn't know that she was mixed with black. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just people trying to qualify you just based off of how you look. And it's like, you know, I don't understand why people feel the need to do that. Casey and I talked about it and it's like, I think people do it just because it's like, it makes them feel more comfortable. Yeah, it's easy. Because it's like, okay, now I know how to label them or what box to put them in. So, okay, now I feel better. Yeah. So, and that's that's why she started that YouTube to really talk about um, her experience and how people treat her just based off of how she looks. Yeah, I'm always of the, the thought process that it's what you do with the initial set of information that you have that really kind of decides where you where you land on certain things so mm -hmm. you know people may have their initial response to you but what do they do with the information that you give them afterward right that helps them decide whether or not they're going to do a certain thing so but you know what that helps me decide too yeah because based off of what information i give them and how they treat me after that mm -hmm. helps me decide like you know what this person's cool i could see myself being friends with them and that's how I've had lifelong friendships, regardless of what I look like. And then there are other people that I'm like, no, nah, I'm good on you. <laughs> like, see, you know, like, maybe if you have evolved years from now, who knows? And I mean, I have met some people that have been ignorant with me that later, they're very open and welcoming to me. And probably because, like, they knew that mm. they couldn't come at me like that either. You give a lot of different things. So if, <laughs> and I'm saying that no in a really yeah, good way. Okay. So if I pick up the phone and I call Cindy Wilson in for an interview and I hear mm -hmm. your voice, mm -hmm. you give very much Southern Belle, like you said. Mm -hmm. And then if I look at your resume and I see Jackson State for your undergrad and mm -hmm. your master's, you I'm see, thinking. But then you see Cindy and you're like, wait, what? Right. Then you see Wilson right. and you're like, wait, what? Right. So I'm like, okay. So there's a black girl coming to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Here comes Cindy walking in, <laughs> right? So you're constantly surprising people. I, and I, I love that now. Lo <laughs> I used to be like, you know, like, oh, gosh. They're going to be like, what in the world? But now I'm just like, like I say in my book, that's how, like, life should be. Like, so let's surprise the heck out of people and let people know you can't judge a book by its cover. Because I talked about that experience when I moved to Alabama mm -hmm. and the recruiters that were like, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> but the, as we became friends, they were like telling me how they were trying to figure it out. But then when I walked through the door, they were like, okay, wait. Yeah, nobody what? guessed. Nobody <laughs> expected that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I love it now. And and surprise people you did. Like I said, you kind of you came out of nowhere with the book. And I and I, I told you before we, we started recording that I liked your approach where you kind of just like, hey, I've been working on the story of my life for the last year. Yeah. <laughs> Here you guys go. Right. <laughs> and, um, and like I said, it's just a, an incredible story. And I'm so glad Thank that you. I got a chance to talk to you actually before you went I know. To, to Korea. Because that, like it is, it's, 
it's a it's, it's a full circle journey. moment. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a full circle moment, but you're also opening a, a new door at the same time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So tell people where they can find your book. So my book is on Amazon, or you can go to my website. I have a website. <laughs> it's www.too muchsoul.com so t-o-o-m-u-c-h-s-o-u-l.com also on instagram at asian underscore southern underscore bell and then i've got a too much soul underscore book instagram page also um and i'm on facebook but you know <laughs> so do you have anything coming up with the book are you doing any uh sign i know you just had a signing that i missed yeah so yeah. i had a signing this past weekend which was great um a lot of people came out with their books some people didn't have one so they bought me out so that was awesome hey that's always and then nice. i had a section and that was awesome <laughs> the, and so you know i called it the book release party but it was really the cindy release party <laughs> And then I did an interview with Rise. That article came out today. And I'm supposed to get with my book club that I've been a part of for a couple of years now. And they're going to read my book at the end of September. We're going to talk about it. And then probably the biggest thing that I'm just super excited about is I'm going to be doing a book signing at Jackson State University, my alma mater, uh, the week of homecoming. So October 8th um, in the bookstore, which is like amazing. I'm also the Saturday before going to be doing like a book signing book discussion at Churchill, one of my friends, Cigar Shops. And I talk about in the book how I love the Big John's, the Smoke Snow Hot. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be cooking oh, wow. there too. So <laughs> it's just going to be like jacked out of the house. Probably most excited about the the bookstore signing because I just I love Jackson State and writing the book and just talking about my experience and how much I love it and how much I value not only the experience but why HBCUs were created made me end up becoming a lifetime alumni because like that's how we keep these schools open is by supporting them. And so I just, I was like, I have to support them to the fullest. Yeah. So go Jackson State, Sonic <laughs> Boom, the South, get ready. <laughs> so now that you've, you've gone through the process of releasing the book, is it therapeutic for you to now have it out there? I know you spent a little over a year yeah. from, you know, the first time you put pen down to paper to yeah. it actually being out there. Yeah. How, how do you feel now that it's out there? It is 100% therapeutic. Like when you write a book, and, and I'll say this too, I'm very social and I'm very open. Like you can ask me anything and I'll tell you, but I am a very private person. So there are certain things that I just don't talk about. So I was very intentional of what I did talk about. Like those were the things that impacted me the most and what I was able to also impact. Um... And so I wrote with a purpose. So it wasn't just like this tell all, like putting all my business out there. And even though some people that read it in a day, I was like, yeah, you read that in a day because you're nosy. <laughs> um, and the people that read it in a day, they know who, I'm like, yeah, you're, and they're like, yeah, I was nosy. But I was very intentional to really put out that message of just humanity and like giving people a chance to be human in their experience and knowing that we're all affected by our experiences with how we were raised, our environment, how we grew up. And right now we live in an environment where everybody talks about race and culture and identity, but nobody is really having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So kind of like what we're doing now. And that's why I have like discussion questions or like conversation starters at the end of the book, because I think it's just time to like, let people just be honest and open and free and be able to really tell their truths of like their experience so we can understand it better instead of, well, no, you should just know, or you should just get that or understand. And, you know, some people are like, well, okay, well, wait, what am I supposed to get? I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me. You should already, you know, and it's like, we just shame and guilt people into feeling bad, but then it just, what it causes is people are scared to 
to talk about things now or be honest or and until people are able to really be honest nothing is going to get resolved so um that that's a lot of what i hope comes out of the book good good and, and i hope you'll get that i think you will i got a chance to read the book and i hope that everyone else does like Cindy told you hit up too much soul.com you can get a copy of the book there you can go on amazon you can of course hit her up on instagram and ask her anything that i didn't get to ask yeah, her today for sure. and kindle uh hopefully that will be coming out soon so be on the lookout for that as well and eventually i want to do an audible but whew, um kind of got a lot on my plate right now <laughs> but hopefully i'll be able to get to that soon and kent may be able to help me with that since he's like the <laughs> guru at everything uh, look, I'm, I know a little something. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. Uh, <laughs> Cindy, thank you so much for for chatting with me today. And to you guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Ungentrified. Of course, you can find Ungentrified on Instagram and Twitter at Ungentrified Pod. Or you can visit the website, UngentrifiedPodcast.com. You can find out more about me, your host, on Instagram and Twitter as well at Kent W. Johnson. If you want to be a great person, tell a friend about the show. Give me a review. Those always help as well. And subscribe so that you're constantly aware whenever I drop a new episode. That's it for us. Thank you for listening, and we'll check you next time on The Gentrified. Thanks, guys. Peace.